well, Hugh, you've done it again, written another book. Uh, you're, you're pretty good at doing that. And this one is for who now? Well, this book is really targeting people who are interested in the creation evolution debates and are really looking for some pathway and how do we can resolve this. I'm also looking at the book as a witnessing tool uh, so that people can use this to uh, you know, share with their uh, non-Christian friends and skeptics that they might write into in their family or at work or amongst their friends. It's also uh, the one book that we have here, Reasons to Believe, that gets you through the full scope of our biblical testable creation model. I mean, I tried to do that in a previous book, Creation of Science. This is much more extensive. And uh, also, I'm really looking at the book being able to work two ways for lay uh, readers who don't have much background in science, uh, but also for those who, say, have advanced degrees in science. And that's because with the advance of technology, uh, we've been able to put much of the book in electronic form. Uh, so the, uh, the scholars who want to dig into the, the technical details, uh, we have appendices that go with the book. They're electronic appendices. And believe it or not, the appendices are longer than the written book. <laughs> okay. So, and the book itself is, uh, let's see, how many pages? I've got one right It's here. 300 pages. About 300, yes. And okay. one of the appendices in itself is about 300 pages. If you want to know where you can get them, they're on our website. So, uh, on our website, you can get the electronic appendices that, uh, that accompany this book. Lots of fun. So as a layperson, I'm not going to be terribly intimidated, and I, I'm going to be able to get my way through the book. You'll be fine, although uh, for the scholar, again, I, put, uh, I really loaded up the book pretty heavily with endnotes. So if people want to search the original scientific literature and the uh, theological literature, they'll be able to do that uh, in considerable depth. But, of course, a lot of lay readers uh, may be willing to take my word for it and skip reading all the journals. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, And, again, we put that all at the end of the book so it doesn't disturb the flow of the reading of the book. Yeah. Hugh, you've kind of talked about what the book's about here in the first chapter, but let me ask uh, another question. In this year of uh, Darwin celebrations, there have been lots of books written by what are called the New Atheists. You're very familiar with them. Uh, is this a response to that type of uh, atheism? Well, very much. There's a reason why we brought this book out on Darwin Day. I mean, February 12th is uh, when we released the book. And, uh, you know, that's the celebration of uh, Darwin's uh, 200th anniversary of his birth. And we're coming up on the 150th anniversary of his book, Origin of Species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this book is really designed uh, to help people deal with the challenge of evolutionism and Darwinism. And it's really a good response, too, to the new atheists who are trying to claim that uh, belief in God uh, or uh, uh, Christianity uh, has no rational base. And uh, their charge is that the Christian faith isn't falsifiable or testable. It's not predictive. And this book really exposes uh, those fallacies and shows that that's simply not true. Uh, I can't think of anything that's more testable and falsifiable and predictive than Christianity and the Bible. And so this book is an attempt to show uh, as completely as possible in 300 pages how we can uh, refute these charges. And really, it's designed to be a positive response. Uh, I see a lot of these atheists, rightly so, looking at Christians and saying, all your arguments are negative. You simply attack us. Well, this book is an attempt to produce a positive case for the Christian faith, and we actually invite the skeptics to uh, do what they can uh, to critique the model that we're laying out in the book. So you posit this model. Is it your hope that this could uh, lead to resolution in this creation-evolution maelstrom? Well, not entirely, because as the Bible points out, there will always be those that rebel against the truth. Uh, but yes, I do think the book is going to be a significant tool uh, for resolving these creation-evolution controversies for anyone who's committed to follow the truth and the evidence where it may lead. And uh, there's a lot of people in that category, so uh, I think that this is going to be a powerful book for Christians to use uh, in, their, in their witness. Do you introduce the model then in the very first chapter, or do you, do you develop it over... Well, we develop it. I mean, okay. uh, in one sense, it was a real uh, challenge for us here at Reasons to Believe to even think about uh, trying to put in one book uh, the scope of our testable creation model. After all, we have probably eight books out there mm -hmm. that give pieces of the model. Mm -hmm. you know, And even one piece, like the origin of life, deserves a 300-page response. Right. Uh, so in one sense, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, fearful that uh, people will not get a full enough 
look at our model in just this one book, but in one sense we're in a good position. We've got eight books out already that give pieces of the model, and therefore anyone who says, look, this isn't in sufficient depth, well, we have citations to our earlier works that do take it uh, into that degree of depth. But also, for those who already have the eight books, this is our latest, and so it's given me an opportunity to show how, for example, our origin of life model has been updated by the discoveries that have taken place since we put out our book on the origins of life. And I kind of do that uh, with each of the uh, sections, human origins, uh, the origin of the universe, the design of the universe. You see updates all the way through. And also what I've done in the book is try to develop a lot more tests for a model than we've ever been able to publish in the past. There's a lot of brand new tests uh, that people can use not only to put our model to the test, but to put models that compete with us also to the test. So hopefully it'll give uh, people tools when they're talking to their friends on uh, you know, just how to engage them in conversation where, in the words of the Apostle Paul, everything is tested. We hold fast to that which is good. Yeah. So this is no recent venture in case someone's wondering, well, you just put out a book because you want to respond to everything uh, that's going on in, in, the, in the Darwin celebrations. You've been developing this model, as you mentioned, the other books over some time. How long? Uh, well, I personally have been working on this testable creation model for over 30 years and a, in a very serious way for the past 25 years. So it's kind of the culmination of a quarter of a decade of research. And now, of course, I'm being joined by a number of colleagues that are on our staff, plus a lot of volunteer scholars that uh, participate in our research efforts here at uh, Reasons to Believe. And we would have brought the book out whether it was a Darwin celebration or not, mm -hmm. because you know we felt this is the right time uh, to come out with a, a fairly detailed uh, summary of our testable creation model. And really, it's a way that people can kind of look at more than a theory and use that as a way to get into other books. All right. Well, we will do that as we continue with these podcasts. What, what can we look forward to in the next one? Well, what I'm going to do in the, the next podcast is kind of show you uh, who the players are uh, on the creation evolution spectrum. I mean, a lot of people get the idea it's just atheism versus Christianity. It's much more complex than that. And uh, then we're also going to kind of introduce the idea, uh, what do we mean by a model, how to put things to the test. So we'll kind of cover that in the, the next podcast. Uh, you introduced it in the first chapter. I think I probably need to know a little bit more about a model as a layperson, though, as you start talking about the second chapter. Sure, because in the second chapter, we talk about uh, the different models and model players. And uh, chapter one is where we really define what a model is. And a model is much more than a hypothesis or a theory. Uh, a model is an, uh, an attempt by researchers to provide a detailed, comprehensive explanation of a set of phenomena. In the case of creation evolution, we're talking about the entire record of nature. So it's a really big job to try to lay out a detailed, comprehensive explanation. It needs to cover all the scientific disciplines. And for the Christian, it also needs to cover all the creation accounts we see in the Bible. So it's a huge integrative job to pull all this together. And it takes some time, I would imagine. It takes some time, and uh, you need to sh show how it's able to answer the different why questions that people will be posing, uh, how the mechanisms work. It's not enough to lay out what happens, when and where it happens, but you need to explain how it happens, and uh, why it would happen from your particular philosophical perspective. I mean, for example, why would the God of the Bible do the things that you would claim that you see in the record of nature? So those are all critical components of the model, and also it's not a model unless you can demonstrate to people who take different positions how your model can be put to the test, how it can be affirmed uh, by discoveries, how it can be falsified.